Welcome to Derek, which is the Hebrew word for the way. And this is where we meditate on the way. It is a show about the Psalms. We're meditating on the way that the Psalms offer us as a, as a way of flourishing in life under the reign of God. My name is John Mark, Hick, John Mark Hicks, and welcome. And my name is Bobby Valentine, and we do want to welcome you here today as we do meditate on the way, a particular way of God today as we think about what kind of God we have and uh, how wonderful he actually is to his people. It's just a wonderful text we're going to be looking at, Psalm 130. Yes, our text today is Psalm 130, which is only eight verses, very short, but very powerful psalm it is one of the psalms the penitential psalms one of the psalms that the church has used to confess sin or to talk about sin to pray about sin and uh, this is a, a a powerful psalm that as you as you talk about bobby later uh, that introduces god to us uh, as the forgiving chesed god shows mercy Absolutely. upon us and it's one of the songs of ascent and and we uh, have not done a song of ascent yet this is our first one to do the songs of ascent are from psalm 120 to 134 and basically those psalms are about the people of israel ascending to god they're, they're ascending to the temple they're ascending to the holy space they're coming before god they're kind of on a pilgrimage uh, from their home to the temple you might say and they're in a process of moving into the holy space to be blessed by god and so these psalms are are psalms that were sung kind of on the way you might say on the way right. in a liturgical sense on the way into that holy space so tell us more about the songs of ascent and where where do where does psalm 130 fit in to okay. the songs that's a good question. Uh, the Psalms of Ascent, of course, are incredibly important in the, both the history of Israel and in uh, Christian history in terms of our liturgy. They were used in the temple in Jesus' day for all the high holy days. But the Psalms of Ascent are in the Book 5 of the Psalter. Book 5 begins with Psalm 107, which seems to be like a gathering up of the people of God who have been scattered among the nations. They have been in exile. And God remembers his hesed in the people of God that is steadfast love or grace or mercy. You know, that word can be translated multiple ways. And God brings them together. And following that, we have this uh, wonderful thing that we call the Egyptian Hallel, which is almost like a telling of the a poetic telling of the Exodus story. God is saving his people, maybe this time not out of Egypt, but it is the Egyptian Hallel, but reconstituting them as the people of God in kind of a new Exodus. And you get to Psalm 119, where do people go after the Exodus? They end up at Mount Sinai, and you have this magnificent Torah psalm where the people of God are praying, open our eyes so that we can see you and walk with you and, and be what you want. We've gone astray like a lost sheep, now forgive us. And immediately after that, you have a new story. You got Exodus and Sinai, and all of a sudden with the songs of ascent, you're going to Mount Zion. You're going to the place where God is not going to dwell with us in a tabernacle. God's going to dwell with us in the temple. He's going to be in the midst of the people, among the people. And so Psalms, the Psalms of Ascent tell the story all together of the people of God going to a pilgrimage that culminates in the presence of God in Psalm 133, where all God's people are united and they're one. There's no differences between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the rich and the poor, no difference between the males and the females. We come before the Lord and we are blessed like the dew that falls on Aaron's beard. And then the very next thing, 134, there's God. You know, we are in the temple of the Lord and all those who are in his tabernacle, in his sanctuary, it says, and we're blessed. And Psalm 130 is the 11th one in Psalm, the Psalms of Ascent. 
And it tells the story. <clears throat> well, it confesses Israel's faith in a certain kind of God. It's the Exodus 34, verse 6 God. It's the God who, whose hesed is greater than our sin. We are sinful. We have been wayward. We have walked away. We have been rebellious. We have been stiff-necked. But God, we believe in this God, the God of the covenant, the God of Hesed, who will forgive us and bring us before him. And so the next psalm, Psalm 131, shares the same thing. The sky is, too, things are too marvelous for me, but in you, Lord, I have quieted my soul. I've quieted myself. I've taken comfort in you. And that prepares us. Perhaps Psalm 30, 130 is kind of like the closer you get to a holy place, the more nervous we get because we become more conscious of our sin, more conscious of our failings. But also we become more hopeful because it is there in the temple, it is there in the presence of God that we know that we're not going to be destroyed Instead, we're going to find the healing presence. We're going to find the, the Spirit of the Lord that puts us back together. And so it culminates there in the presence of God. That's how Psalm 130, I think, yeah. fits into this and says, God, we, we, we believe, verses 3 and 4, kind of like the center of the whole psalm. What kind of God are you? And if you were like this, we would be dead. We'd be exiled. We'd be the dead bones in Ezekiel. But because you're not, you are actually the God of Psalm 107, who gathers the people together from all the nations. Some were doing this, and some were doing that, some were doing that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Yahweh's grace <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, reaches into the grave, so to speak, the abyss. That's how this, the the depths. There's no place that God cannot hear us calling to him. Yeah. And this is such a powerful, wonderful uh, Psalm. Luther, who has a unique view of Paul, for, but he says this is a Pauline Psalm. <laughs> That's how he described it. It's a great doctor of scripture, is Psalm 132. And he wrote a great hymn uh, called From the Deepest Woe I Cry, based on this particular psalm. It's a powerful one, and it's one of my favorites. Yeah. I've read it so, and prayed it for years. So. I, liked, I liked your image of as you're approaching the holy space, whether it's temple or whatever it is, as you're approaching the holy God, you become conscious, you become more conscious of how right. distant that is. The, exactly. between ourselves and the holy god and exactly. so it could create fear it could create a dread it could create shame it could create a lot of negative emotions but exactly. in psalm 130 there's a kind of a waiting we're waiting on because we know who this god is yeah uh, this this god is the god of chesed or chesed the the grace right. mercy covenant love uh, and so we come into that space, acknowledging our sin, confessing our sin, but also anticipating and hoping in, waiting for the response of the God in whom there is forgiveness and and grace. And so, exactly, you know, as you were, as you talk about the ascent, the pilgrimage, as we walk through Psalm 120 to 134, as we go through the pilgrimage, this is that this Psalm and, and 131 are the space where we basically become confessional and say, we exactly. haven't been all we should be. And the confessional then leads us into the blessing of 133, 134, um, so that we arrive, you might say, exactly. at, yeah. in the presence of God and experience the grace of God and the communion Absolutely. of God, right? Exactly. So that's exactly. kind of, those, the ascents are moving in that direction. So it's, it's a powerful way of walking through uh, our own stories, as well as the it story is indeed, of it is indeed, yeah, and it's an expectation, you know. I don't want to call it a taking for granted, but Psalm one thirty, the Israelites as they come before the Lord, they they have no doubt that God is going to forgive them. They have no doubt. Yeah. I think and that's a, that's a that, good way of saying it. No doubt. I don't know if expectation is the right word. But yeah, that's yeah, almost it's kind of obligatory. But exactly, because we know who God is. Exactly. We hope in this, and we trust in this, right? 
him. And there's numerous echoes here to that story, as we've mentioned in several of these psalms, to that golden calf, you know, I mean, that's where the God creed is given. And Israel believes, you know, if God can forgive that, then yeah. he can do this. And he did do that. And I, I always connect that with Jesus on the cross. If they can, if, if God can forgive and Jesus can forgive those people who kill him, <laughs> what, what cannot be forgiven? You know, I mean, right. it just is a, just a powerful way. This is who our God is. This is such a wonderful picture of the faith that we who are trying to walk on the way, we're not perfect by any stretch. We're confident, not in ourselves, but we're confident in the one we're following in the way. And well, it we, is, we built this psalm up. Maybe there's high expectations of what this psalm's going to say now, because we, because we're, we're waxing uh, eloquent, you might say, <laughs> on, on on how powerful this psalm is. So yeah. let's go ahead and read it. But as we read it, I think uh, it might be helpful to remember that when you're reading verses one to four, you're talking to God, right? Yeah, right. You, Lord, you, Lord. Um, and it's an I talking, crying out to God. But then you get into verse 5, and it's um, I wait for the Lord. It's it's not addressing God anymore. It's talking about God. That's right. And clearly, when we get to verse 7, the, uh, the psalmist is addressing Israel, addressing the, the community. So I yeah. think... I think it's fair to say verses one to four, he's addressing God. And in verses five to eight, the psalmist is, a, is addressing the congregation yep. uh, where he's assembled or, or, or um, a part of this ascent group that is with him or whoever it is particularly, but is addressing the community of Israel. Um, so that's the shift that happens in verse from verses one to four to verses five to eight. Right. All right, Bobby, let's, um, All right. let's read it. You ready? Let's read it. Now I'm reading. Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah, such a such an awesome man. That's that's text. worth just ruminating on and savoring because uh, there's is. so much there. So let's there let's let's talk about the first part then that where he's talking to God and. Um, and particularly the psalmist, out of the depths, I cry to you, the depths. Out of the depths. I mean, that the depths reminds us of, of kind of water and being and drowning in water, being overwhelmed yeah. by water, reminds us of the exodus in a lot of ways. Exactly. Uh, it's out of the sense of drowning, I'm being overwhelmed, I'm crying out to you because I'm feeling... You know, I'm I'm feeling the 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 toxic shame. I'm feeling the guilt. I'm feeling the right. struggle. I'm feeling you know I'm out of sorts. I'm in exactly. trouble. You know, exactly. so it's out of that chaos that I cry out to Yahweh, to <clears throat> to the you know the covenant God, the exactly. God in whom I have a relationship, the one in with exactly. whom I have covenant. And so, you're the one that I'm crying exactly. out to you to hear my voice. Yeah, the spatial imagery here is fascinating. So if we're going up the steps, you know, God is in heaven. The top of the steps kind of symbolizes the realm of God and where God is way up in the heavens. And we are in the depths. We are as far away mm -hmm. as possible. And I actually like the rendering here of abyss. Abyss is this bottomless pit that 
is in a watery grave like the movie the abyss you know it was like man just way 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 down there surrounded and the only possible there's there's no possibility of of saving yourself keeping yourself from drowning yeah. the only escape from this is rescue right so you the only from drowning right that's right some some someone got to throw a lifeline way down in the depths but here, no matter where Israel is or the people of God find themselves, the psalm begins with the faith that God hears. Mm -hmm. Even though he's there and we are here, there is no inappropriate place to approach God. There's no inappropriate place to call on the Lord. Wherever we find ourselves, they're not calling to God on the basis of good deeds, on the basis of having it all together. They're little Israel or the individual person here who I think represents Israel, their life is in a shambles. So badly is it in shambles that they are in the depths. They are overwhelmed. They are drowning. And there's only one possible escape. And that is rescue. That's what God did to is, uh, Israel and Egypt. There was no no escape. They had to be rescued. And I th that is how the psalm begins. We we require rescue. We require the yeah. deity of the covenant to do something because we're dying. Yeah. We are in someone to rescue us from drowning, right? To throw absolutely, us the absolutely. So I, and, I like the idea of the distance there. Um, you have a sense of of Israel scattered among the nations. Yeah, and no matter where they are, they can cry out to God. No matter where exactly. they are, they can pilgrimage to the temple. They can come and seek the forgiveness or seek the rescue that they need. Or, as it says in verse 2, cry out for the mercy. Absolutely. The mercy. Absolutely. So I think you're right that this is not about, uh, hey, we're Israel, we deserve this, you know, or we're right. Israel, and therefore we are the special people who who get all God's goodies. And now what Israel receives is mercy. They're, they're, exactly. they're not sitting in a situation where they can make demands of God, right? <laughs> they're crying they out for mercy. They cannot make demands. Yeah. They are. So, and, you know, there is that sense of the depth of our sin or the depth of our struggles. Uh, and the only way out of that is to cry for mercy. Exactly. And, and God's response is a response, as we'll see in the second half here, of forgiveness and, and chesed. Yeah. In other places, you know, the Psalms will talk about being weighted down with an iron fitter. For a long time, mm -hmm. I didn't know what an iron fitter was, you know, but I found it's like handcuffs on your feet and iron chain ball, you know, and somebody's <laughs> tossed you into the sea and and our iniquities, as he's going to talk about, they're, they're the ones keep on pulling us down into the abyss, you know, mm -hmm. and going down, 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 down. There is no escape. I don't care how hard you try to swim. If you're chained down, you are going down. You are going down and... This, but the psalm begins. The he hear, he's going to hear. Yeah, and uh, wow, that's and, a horrible image of uh, being chained and thrown into the water. I mean, that's uh, well, it is, it is. But that's um, that's what our sin is. It's it, it's a bondage. It's a captivity. Absolutely, and, and only absolutely. only God can break the chains, right? Only God. And so, the psalm. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the faith of the psalm. And the songs of Ascent is that the God of Israel hears and will respond appropriately in so, grace and mercy. Yes, so so what do you think is going on in verse three when he says, if you, Lord, kept a record of sin, if you if you watched over our the word their record is about watching or keeping, guarding. And so different translations will will have a different nuance to this. Yeah. Uh, what do you understand that? to mean if you lord keep a record of our sins lord who could stand yeah i think verses four and five together actually three and four together are the ground of the prayer they are the basis they are the center the orbiting mass of it 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 says if god was like this if god was a certain kind of god if God was like the idols, if God was, to use a contemporary image, a God of precision obedience, the God of the technicalities, if God was like this, then nobody yeah. can stand. Psalm 143 is going to say, yeah. yeah, nobody actually has genuine uh, righteousness on their own, no autonomous righteousness. We, we don't have 
we're in the abyss. There's nothing that we can hold on to. So if God was a God who marked or kept a record of this interesting word here that's translated in different ways in, in the Bible, uh, shamar is the mm. root, and it, here it's in the imperfect. It's, it's If God is sitting there taking notes, an ongoing thing, you know, that's not completed, yeah, a he's just, he's trying to, he's getting, making an extensive note. But this word is also translated as keep over there in Psalm 121. God is the keeper of Israel. Hey, there he's holding on to it. He's keeping it. And it's also translated guard, you know, so God is not guarding our faults and our mistakes, our rebellion, as Psalm, I mean, Exodus 34 says, he forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And here he says, if God marked, if God searched out for, if God was looking for, I really like that image, if God was sitting there looking like this, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the slightest infraction, you yeah. know, instead, the opposite of that is, now that's what we do. And he's going to use the image of the century later, the watchman, and here the word itself is built into that to make a play on the word. Uh, centuries are up there on the wall, and they are looking for the slightest movement on the horizon, something that disturbs. That lets you know that something, an enemy is coming, or the first hint of light on the horizon. And your your intent, see that the image is the intent. I am intentionally searching for stuff. And the psalmist says, Yahweh is not like that. Mm. Because if Yahweh was like that, we have so many, you don't even have to search yeah, who for could, them. Who they could are stand obvious. There? Who could get I mean, by that, right? Who, that's right. Who it's could like, slip past that watcher? <laughs> there, nobody can. That's right. It is such a mm -hmm. powerful declaration of the faith of Israel, of what kind of God Yahweh is. Yeah. God is and, the gracious God. He's the merciful God. This is so, so contrary to the way some people envision Yahweh, the, the Absolutely. God of Israel. <clears throat> they, they envision that God, a God of wrath, They're kind of like a Zeus who's sitting on the edge of his oh. throne with a lightning bolt, just itching to zap somebody i mean we just exactly wanna, give me a <clears throat> give me a reason make my day you know kind yeah. of thing right uh you, but that's not who this god is Yahweh right. is, doesn't do that god this is he's not a technical god who's trying to search out oh well you did that or you did yeah. that and I, oh i'm now i gotta do this and and he has some kind of joy or delight in exactly responding with some kind of uh, exactly. punishment or wrath. Yeah, uh, you my didn't God cross your keep the technical record. Yeah, that, that's right. He doesn't keep a record. He doesn't keep this technicality stuff. He doesn't look to see if your eye is dotted just right in your T. You know, and throughout, you know, sometimes we will point to certain stuff like Nadab and Abihu or Uzzah touching and say you know god actually is the god of details god is the but you know the rest of the scriptures kind of go the other way god looks at the heart god looks at the heart god looks mm -hmm. at the heart and yeah. the great counterpoint to that is hezekiah's great uh passover where it just says, you know what? They didn't do it according to the rules of the sanctuary. They didn't do it according to the Bible. Yeah. They didn't do it right. Nobody was clean. Nobody was ever. And, you know, Second Yahweh Chronicles not, 30. he blessed yeah. it. Yeah, he, he's Second like, Chronicles this 30. is this is the, and see, and there, Psalm 130 and Second Chronicles 30 kind of come together because Hezekiah knew what kind of God Yahweh yeah. was. Hezekiah knew. So he prays. He says, we know that you look at this, so accept this, forgive these people this, and it says the Lord healed the people. And it's, yeah. that's exactly, that's God, exactly. God accepts seekers whose hearts seek a God, right? I mean, that's, Absolutely. that's part of what's going on there in Second Chronicles. So it, that's how these does, people. Uh, you know, when you come to verse 4, because when you, if God doesn't keep a record of sins, what is God doing? If he's not making a record, what is, what is God's action here? How is God responding he forgives, as it says, yeah, verse four, forgiveness, forgiveness. There is this the forgiveness. There is that's right. Yeah. It has the article here. It's not just 
some abstract it is the place that you come to god is sovereign and he has the key to forgiveness he holds the forgiveness as it's going to say later on he's got the hesed as well kind mm -hmm. of an unusual construction but he says you have the forgiveness this doesn't depend on me it doesn't depend on anybody else this is this the sovereign declaration of Yahweh, as he said to Moses, again, in Exodus 33, I will have mercy on yeah. whom I will have mercy. Yeah. I so, I have that. You do not. And God, we, we you don't do this, but you do do this. Mm -hmm. You've already showed us who you are. You've told us who you are. You've confessed your own name. And now God is just true to himself. He is, he holds the forgiveness so this is why we cry for mercy. We we cry out for mercy because we have the confidence that God is not a technical record keeper, like exactly. some kind of accountant measuring and balancing out. Exactly. God is not a record. He, what what God is God. Well, with God, there's forgiveness. That's, that's right. That's why we cry for mercy. We 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 are we have the hope of mercy because of the nature of our God. He's not a technical God. He's exactly. a God of where you find the forgiveness the and forgiveness. there's a result to that when there is you know, so that um so, how do you understand that next line bobby so that we can with reverence serve you is is the way the that's right. niv puts it but i mean that's an expanded translation but it's yeah. really just the word fear so that we fear yeah. you, you know? yeah so did you we wrote you know, it, it, of course that word has a multifaceted word but here the idea is that uh uh, so that you can respond appropriately to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really, I think, is the idea here. But it is uh, the case here that Exodus comes before Sinai. Grace came before faith. Obedience yeah. didn't establish this. Uh, nothing on our part. We're in the abyss. We're in the we're in the depths. And but God's forgiveness establishes or makes possible the human response that is appropriate. It is the thing that, as Paul's going to say, you know, it is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And that's mm -hmm. the kind of idea here, except that it goes, I think, beyond what Paul actually says. This is so that you can be worshipped, so that you can be loved, so that we can respond to you. We can't do this on our yeah. God's forgiveness makes it possible for the humans, for Israel, to respond um, in faith, right. so grace so, becomes comes before faith, and it's yeah. That's, so that word fear is really kind of a, it's a very pregnant idea. It's a oh, it's very absolutely. all encompassing kind of idea. It's not just a, it's not about being afraid of this God. No, we're crying for no. mercy. There's forgiveness right. with this God. That's right. We're going to worship this God. We're going to exalt this God. We're going to revere this God. We're going to be in relationship with this God. So fear is that word that is kind of like the summary word of all human response. It's uh, it this, establishes this is a way of saying responding to God, right? That's yeah. right. Sometimes things are just so unbelievable that uh, they humble us. You know, and I think this one is like a, a trembling uh, thankfulness before the Lord. Like, I can't believe he just did that. Yeah. I can't believe that he is that good. I can't believe that he is um, God. God could even possibly do that. And it mm. just kind of like pulls something not only out of us. And this is. The wording here, even though in the Psalms of Ascent, this is I, Israel, but this is the, this is for everybody, you know, everybody that we believe in this God. God elicits the faith of the nations because oftentimes it will say in other places that when the nations see what God has done for Israel, they will praise the yeah. Lord. They will say, oh, how awesome. How can this is this is unbelievable. How can how can you let this go? But God does. Yahweh does, because yeah, that's think, the God uh, of Israel. I think if you think about this in a personal sense, you, if you think of someone in your life whom you did wrong and they and you and you cry out for mercy for them and they just say, I forgive you and yes. everything's restored and you know you don't deserve it. You know you don't deserve that friendship. 
And yet, what are you what are you feeling when that happens? You're feeling kind yeah. of like, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe that's, that's how right. you responded to this. What yeah. what can I do for you? <laughs> how Absolutely. can I how can I be in relationship with you? How can I yeah. live with you? You know, I how do I say thank you yeah. for your forgiveness? And I think that's yeah. what we're talking about with that line. Exactly. Is how do I say thank you uh, for that you know, forgiveness? It's kind of um, a crass analogy, but I. I've seen this many times in my life, um, like with an animal that has been wounded or injured and, and a person is kind to that animal. The animal suddenly adopts the human, you know, it's like, I love you. I want to, mm. I want to, I want to follow you around. I want to take care of you. You know, I want to, I want to be with you. And yeah. that sort of here, God has done the same thing. He has blessed with the forgiveness He's the one who holds the forgiveness. And that's the ground. That is the thing that establishes even the possibility of our being in that relationship, a worshipful one, a reverent one, full of mm -hmm. all. God is all inspiring. That's that's what's going on here. His yeah. his graciousness is something to behold. And it that's why it compels us. You know, exactly. Yeah, it's, that sort it's of thing. Like, Just like the love of Christ compels us, as you know, Paul says. Second exactly. I, so it is as, just, we, as we come to five and six, it, we're gonna do we're gonna do this waiting game here. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and the word wait is also there was two different words for wait. Um, like in verse five, I wait for the Lord. Then mm -hmm. the NIV, NIV says, In his word I put my hope. So you there's they're kind of overlapping synonyms. Um, yeah. But this sense of waiting, it's it's like I'm I'm approaching the temple. I'm I'm approaching the holy space. I've confessed my sin. I know who God yep. is. And now I'm I'm going to enter this space and wait for God to act. And it's my hope. My whole being is going to wait. My nephish, my soul, my, right. my whole person. Right. Is I'm yep. bringing my whole self into this space That's right. and waiting I, on mm -hmm. God and waiting for the word, you know, waiting for the word. What, what is he talking about when he says, I'm waiting for the word and his word, I yeah. put my hope. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, waiting and hope, those are, as you've said, near synonyms, kind of like. That's what people, people who wait on the Lord hope and people who hope in the Lord are, are waiting. And yeah. what they're waiting for is the word of forgiveness, the word, word of, of blessing, grace, even, right? the word yeah. of blessing. And I, I think in the context here of the Psalms of Ascent, that particular word would be from the priest itself, himself. Uh, the ironic blessing, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. You know, there's our word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you. Will He lift His countenance upon you? And may He grant us shalom, which is yeah, where peace, the psalm ends. So I, right now, I'm in the abyss. I'm in the in the depths. I'm far away, but I've called out with the full confidence in a certain kind of God. Now I've called. And his forgiveness is the establishment of our worship, our our obedience, our coming before him. It establishes the avenue of coming into his presence. And now we're waiting. We're waiting confidently, expectantly, with and this hope is not some wishful thinking. Right. Israel it's knows. Not, may, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Yeah, they, you know, they, they know that. That, that this is our hoping is a no. We are waiting on the Lord because we know He is coming in salvation. He's coming mm. in forgiveness. He's coming with arms wide open. He's right. coming to tell us, yes, you are my people. I will wrap you up. I will hold you. I will, as he says to the poor, <laughs> most exilic community in Haggai, and they look and they see the pitiful temple, you know, and he says, don't fear. Don't fear. You know, it doesn't depend on how magnificent this temple is. I am with you, Haggai chapter 2. You know, I'm with you. And he says that twice. Man, I'm with you. Do not fear. Do not fear. Yeah. And that's the word that we're looking for. We are looking for the word of blessing. Because the word of blessing is that we are okay with God. We have been restored. We are in relationship with him. We are his. In spite yeah. of the fact that we find ourselves in the abyss or the depths, we are his by virtue 
of divine forgiveness. Yeah, think about those depths as kind of the darkness, uh, yeah. the night, uh, but we're waiting for the morning. Waiting like, for the like, morning. Like, watch, like watchmen are waiting for the morning. We're waiting for Absolutely. the arrival of the dawn where we can yeah. see see the grace of God and see the exactly. mercy of God when we hear the word, you know, when, when our hope is in the word. So when the word is spoken, then we can experience the morning. Exactly. So we're, we're like watchmen waiting for the morning. We're, we're waiting for, so the, the, the fear of the darkness, That's right. the danger of the darkness uh, goes away and that everything is illuminated. Yeah. We can see the world. Yeah. The morning brings joy, right? The morning. It brings, does. The morning brings joy. And, you know, again, that goes back to verse three, that that same term, what right. Yahweh is not looking for. He's not looking for our infractions, but we are just looking, scanning the horizon for the slightest. God's moving. God's on his way. You know, yeah. the, looking for uh, the light. he's coming. For it's the light. here. Yeah. And the and the one ray of um, it's over. You know, I mean, just. It's over. He's he's here. You know, this is good news. So we are looking. We are looking. And of course, that's going to come through, uh, going to come through the priest. And the priest is going to, as God commands in Numbers chapter six, tell the sons of Aaron to tell my people, say this to them when they come before me and they offer their sacrifice. This is, we're, we're okay. Yeah. We're going to sit down and, you know, we're going to eat. That, that, that's that's what they're going to yeah. do. You, you eat with your with your friends and your family, those people who are your relationship. And of course, these are all going to culminate in every time they're used in Israel on their high holy days. Is is you feast? You yeah, you, you come have a meal. Together. You're at the table with they God, a, right? You're at the and, table and with that's other. right. It's it's like an Exodus 24 moment all over again, where yeah. Moses and Aaron and Nadab, including Nadab and Abihu, going up there. On the mountain, as we're going up the steps, you know, into the presence of God, you know, they're up there on the mountain and they see the God of Israel. Right. And he doesn't right. lift his hand against them. And I, that's what's happening here. We're symbolically going up that step, and we're looking going up that morning. mountain. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, because the Hesed and the forgiveness is with him and God has spoken, let's take a seat. Let's eat with God. I mean, this is profound yeah. stuff in my mind. So when you and it when is you just... um, read Psalm one thirty two to one thirty four, you know one thirty two, God comes to the temple, right? He comes absolutely to in the temple, and then in one thirty three, the priest with the anointing, and then one thirty four is the experience of the blessing. So, absolutely. You know, when we're reading Psalm one thirty one thirty one, we're in this moment of waiting. And then God comes in Psalm 132, and then we experience the blessing. And and the experiencing of the blessing, as you're talking about, is ultimately uh, is part of the table experience. Part exactly. Of, you come and eat with God at the table, whether it's the Passover or Feast of Tabernacles or Unleavened Bread or whatever it is. You're at a table with God, and you, you hear exactly. the blessing, and you experience the joy it's morning in Israel again, you know. You might say. Right. It is morning in Israel, and one thirty four picks up again on this uh, idea that he will be feared, he will be worshipped, because mm -hmm. when you get to one thirty four, he says, "Now those who are here, we bless the Lord, we worship right. the Lord, we 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 have received the blessing, but now in that blessing is the forgiveness. That blessing is the very presence of God." As we said before, you know, it's kind of like a restoration of Eden in here. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, we are with God, and now what do we do? We bless Him, right? We it's not not some him, uh, we, reverence we don't do it the way him, yeah. He does us, but we we are fearing Him, we are We're loving Him, we are re we are reciprocating gratefully, uh, being yeah. able to sit with Him and just enjoy basking the presence in the presence of the Lord. I mean, well, that's you go back to one sixteen, Psalm one hundred and sixteen. You know, with what shall we repay the Lord for all His goodness to us? You know, yeah, I what, will lift up the cup of salvation, absolutely, you know, and I'll keep my vows. I I will absolutely. eat the Thanksgiving sacrifice. That's so right. It's that sort of experience. It's the Passover experience of God has liberated us, and we now enjoy. Um, redemption, which is kind of the word that comes into play in verses seven and eight. So seven and it eight is. is this Exodus language of redemption. That's right. He redeems Israel. And it's all based in, as he talks to Israel now, he's talking to the congregation. 
and says to Israel, you know, put your hope. I'm, I'm waiting on the Lord. You put your hope in the Lord, too. And here's exactly. the reason we can do it. Because with God, with the Lord, is unfailing love, chesed. Now, chesed. Bible, we talk a lot about chesed as we work through the Psalms, and we've mentioned chesed so many times. Maybe we ought to just pause here for a moment. Go a little, do, do a deep dive for us on chesed for a moment. Tell us, okay. tell us what that is. Okay, chesed is... Uh... <laughs> Well, it's God's self-identification in the God Creed in Exodus 34, 6. He uses the term twice there. And the word, I mean, whole books are written on this, this particular word. It's hard to translate uh, into English. The word means covenant love, unfailing love, steadfast love, love, covenant, uh, committed, mercy. He's a mercy, yeah. Uh, Grace in in later parts of the Greek Septuagint, it is translated as grace. It shows up that way in Esther and the Greek Esther. It does all kinds of things. Um, what we and I had a conversation with a Hebrew Bible scholar at Pepperdine a couple years ago, and uh, well, it was more than a couple years ago now. But uh, uh, we had both gone through a divorce and. We were commiserating about uh, uh, certain psalms and things that we had gone through, and he he said this word. He says you'll never find this in the dictionary definition. The lexicons won't say this, but Hesed is, I will not give you up until hell freezes over, or mm -hmm. hell will freeze over before I give you up, and that's what is the bottom line here: that God will be true. God will be faithful even if you are not. God will be true. You can be faithless. You can be stiff-necked. You can be rebellious, but I will be who I am. I am Yahweh. And you see this in Hosea chapter 11, where Yahweh says, I'm going to destroy my people. I'm going to, I'm going to punish them, you know, even though I led my child out of, of Israel when he was a son. But then all of a sudden you get this remarkable self-talk in Hosea chapter 11, where he always says, how can I treat you like Zeboim? How can, how can I do that? Which that's, that's the cities of the plains. How can I reject my daughter? How, right. how, can, I, how mm. can I do that? Mm -hmm. And so he says, I am God and not human. And I will not do that. I will not come in wrath. I will not do this. So here, Israel's hope, and again, this this word occurs like a hundred and seventy six times or so in the in the, the book of Psalms. So it's it's hitting us like a train. Israel does in fact root their entire faith system in this word. If God was anything like the false god of verse three, if he did search out wrongs, Israel would have died in the desert. They would have been obliterated god when they bowed down before the golden calf it would have been over but he always said i forgive you i will be with you i will bring you into the land and so israel who is here in the abyss that's where they are they are in the depths they are posting their with you is the Hesed. The Hesed, right? Like the, the forgiveness of the Hesed. Right? With you, not me. With you is the faithful, the mercy, the covenant love, the the steadfast love, the everything, the the I will not give you up, even if no. hell freezes over, kind of thing. God has the Hesed. Which means and, full redemption. And, in other oh, words, you're in the depths, but I'm gonna rescue you. You're That's in right. Egyptian bondage, but I'm going to rescue you. You know, you're in the That's wilderness, right. but I'm going to rescue you. Well, exactly, and this goes back to Psalm 107, where I started. Okay, some of those people were just doing business. Some were in jail, rotting away because yeah. of their wickedness, rebellion, and sin. They were dying. You know, they were doing, and it's so interesting to read this Psalm 107, which is a good comment. Psalm 103. And Psalm 107 are kind of like psalm commentaries on the word hesed. And at the end of Psalm 107, it says, those who are wise, you know, 
those who are wise will meditate or reflect on the Hesed of the Lord. You mm. know, that he does in the nick of time, he did this, he rescued us. Those people were out on the sea, you know, they, 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 they were about to die and they called called on the Lord just in the nick of time. That's probably one of the best places Eugene Peterson ever does in the Psalms is yeah. Psalm 107. In the nick of time. You know, he reached down and he rescued, and that's what's going on in Psalm 130. We are in the abyss. We got here by ourselves. We rebuild. We have sinned. And it wasn't even just that we made mistakes, you know. There, this God doesn't—we walked away. We brought death upon ourselves. And <laughs> Yahweh reaches down because the Hesed is with you. Yeah. And— uh, and because of that, he has full redemption. Yeah, so I think I think you really you hit on something there. I think is important to emphasize that sin is is the word here in this in Psalm 130. You know, he's absolutely. not a watcher of sins. Uh, there is forgiveness, which is about sin. Or um, he will redeem Israel from all their sins, is the way the psalm actually ends. So. The sin language is, and that's why this is called a penitential psalm, where it's put in that right. category. It's a confession of sin, and it is a hope, a um, a kind of waiting for God to respond with His chesed and forgiveness, because mm -hmm. we are are in the light of our forget in light of our confession of sin. That this mm -hmm. is what we need. We are we are burdened with sin. We are enslaved in sin, and we need a rescue. And that yep. rescue is rooted in the forgiveness and the chesed of God. Yeah. yeah. And I think, again, I just want to stress that word hope again, because Paul says in Romans 8, talking about the redemption of our body, he says, in this hope we are saved. Yeah. Well, that's that's rooted in this kind of language in the Psalms. It's something that is guaranteed to happen. It Again, it has nothing to do with wishful thinking. Israel knows that they are going to be forgiven and welcomed into the presence of God. That yeah. is the hope. It is a knowledge that is rooted in the forgiveness and the hesed, the character of God. It's, and, it's like uh, the watchman waiting for the morning. They, they know right. the sun's going to come yeah. out. You know, the we we wait for the out. redemption of our bodies yeah. because we know it's happening. Yeah, it might be dark right now, but the yeah. sun is coming. Yeah. The sun <laughs> right. is coming. It's going to illuminate the There's, day. Yeah. That's right. There's no way you can stop the sun from rising, and you cannot stop the forgiveness of God. Hmm. It will come. Wow, that's and powerful. That's why we're waiting, and waiting is an act of faith. Yes. It is confident faith. It is hoping. It's an act. It's active. It says says to Israel, Israel, put your hope put your in hope. the Lord. Put your, right. you know, you have to. There's a sense in which we need to seek it, and not only accept it, but seek it and and hope in it and wait for it. There's a there's an active dimension to our Absolutely. our uh, plea here. I cry out for help. I mean, that's an Absolutely. active. Uh, we're responding to the depths in which we're we find ourselves, yeah. and we ask God to rescue, and we're confident yeah. God will rescue. Because we know who God is. And that might be the most fundamental act of faith right there is just simply calling on God to rescue yeah, us. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it's like, I mean, if whatever depths we are in at the moment, whatever sin we're in, whatever struggle we're having, whatever tragedy we're experiencing, faith responds by crying out for help. Absolutely. And, and that's what this psalm does. It is. For sure. uh, Wow, Bobby, it's that's great. That was uh, yeah. that's a powerful psalm, and I it hope uh, those who listen uh, can experience the power of it as we yeah. both experience it and get excited exactly. about it. Exactly. Um, a final word? I, well, I just want to encourage anybody that's listening to us um, to pray this prayer regularly. You know, let it, memorize it, put it in your uh, your your heart. And just utter it, you know, at different places, different times, a couple of times a day, even, you know. I mean, this is, this is, I think, uh, Luther was right. This is the great doctrine of scripture right here that this is kind of like the whole Bible in eight verses. This, this is the story. It's the story of Israel. It's our it's story. The story of Israel right here. The promise 
that we have. We have a good God. We have a marvelous God, a God of forgiveness, a God of hesed. Um, praise his name, and I invite everybody else to do the same. So The God who redeems us from all our sins. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. By the grace Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.